welcome. This is uh, another step in, in uh, our efforts to uh, get streetcars running throughout Seattle. Um, I want to thank our partners at Pacifica. I want to thank our partners at the Czech Republic. Right now, so I want to thank Scott Kubli for stepping in and, and uh, straightening out some issues we have so that we get these uh, moving through our neighborhoods. Scott? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, also want to thank the voters of Seattle for supporting the streetcar. We want to uh, through ST2. Uh, we want to thank the Sound Transit uh, board and staff. Uh, we have uh, uh, Council Member Joe McDermott here uh, in support also of the Sound Transit board. Uh, we want to thank uh, the, uh, the company Inacon that's helping uh, build it in Pacific, their local partner. Uh, this is really the product of a, of a really intensive two or three month effort uh, where we went out did a little renegotiation on the contract, we got the assembly uh, back on track. And now what we're going to do today is we're going to go out and we're going to do a little ride of the car. Uh, so we can walk in the car, walk through the facility. Uh, and, you know, in the coming months, in April and May, we're going to start to see the city, uh, living in the city, are going to start seeing these cars going up and down the track, starting on Jackson and then to Broadway, uh, as we test them. And then later this summer, uh, will launch service and we'll come out with a, a launch date as we get further along in the testing process. So with that, let's just, uh, do you like to say anything? What, what do you sense between when, when well, we're, we're, the whole alignment is in our have off-wire capabilities? Center City's going to run off-wire. Why well, is because they're continuing? Because those they're, cars are going to continue. Right. So you, okay. And it's also going to wind up saving us some money uh, because we don't have to put in the overhead counter. For, for all for first avenue is not going to have overhead cat at all on on the on one side of the the, the downhill side yeah there's not going to be a branch line that's interesting we think so minor square about this uh, uh, project uh, list uh, that identifies what uh, which projects you know you can have through um, I must need to reset that all the system all right but that's okay break that I don't like it when you have a, a, a train that uh, has some testing issues and you start to think about the movies that are around. <laughs> yeah, but watch it frame by frame. The knife never hits to me. Oh, really? Really. Okay. Once was enough. <laughs> Let's just stay. Let's, they're getting pictures. Let's see. We're waiting for, the We're waiting for the signal to come in. Yeah. Or for them to change the signal. <laughs> Find out here if this is. There it goes.
pretty smooth. Yeah. That's really nice. A really tight turn. Yeah, well. What? Yeah, it's a rally arm. Yeah. Did we leave this open so people can see how complicated it is? Oh, <laughs> wait till you see the wiring. Did you get to see the wiring? Ethan Malone, that's E T H A N M E L O N E, Rail Transit Manager for the Seattle Department of Transportation. Right, Ethan, so what are we doing today? Well, um, we had a little test ride with the mayor a few moments ago, and now we're taking a look at the assembly that's underway on three of the vehicles uh, that are still in production, and we're doing some of this assembly right here in Seattle. So a couple of the interesting things that you're going to see, uh, one is on the technology side, uh, and that these cars have a battery drive system and they're state-of-the-art cars. The other is on the human side, that we have a partnership here between a Czech company that's been building streetcars for decades and a local company, Pacifica, uh, that works with local labor and they're, they're learning how to build these cars that, that we used to build in the U.S. Um, and working side by side with uh, some, some technicians who've come over from the Czech Republic to, to help them gain that, that new skill base. Um, so we'll see a little bit of both of those things as we look around the facility, which, by the way, um, is our maintenance facility for this new line. It's also a lead gold building, uh, so it's a very efficient building. Uh, so just a little tidbit there. What's going on here? So um, this car, by the way, you'll, if you look around, you'll see you know we rode on a, a baby blue car. This is a hot pink car. We've got a yellow and a red. These colors were um, inspired by the different cultures and characteristics of, of the diverse neighborhoods along the alignment. Um, the red and the yellow are picking up on uh, some of the, the colors that are significant in uh, you know, Chinese culture. Um, this is intended to sort of pick up on the sort of modern energy of the Capitol Hill neighborhood. One of the cars that's still in the Czech Republic that's um, going to be shipped here is a metallic gold, kind of those Pioneer Square origins of the Klondike Gold Rush. So just a little subtle background to why we have these different different colored cars. So the, uh, the hot pink car here, it, of the cars that's being built here, is furthest along toward final assembly. That means that the roof, which we'll see in a few minutes, will go up onto the mezzanine, you'll be able to see down onto the roof. So the roof wiring and the placement of all the major equipment is um, pretty much complete on this car. And now they've moved into how all these this complex web of technology makes its way down into the car, and particularly right at the front here, what we call the operator's cab. This is sort of like the brain of the car. Everything that's on this car at some point has to get connected into the operator's cab uh, so that the operator can drive the car, open and close the doors, all those kinds of things. Um, so there's a, about 5,000 different wire connections to make. Uh, so it's a pretty uh, you know, painstaking process. I think it's about 8,000 uh, labor hours to do the final assembly of a car. So that's what's going on here. Um, and then as we move about the facility, you'll see some different steps in the production and, uh, and you know, sort of how, how these cars come together. Well, during testing, are we going to see these trolleys make all the way up to Broadway? Uh, I heard it's going to stay pretty close to it's the a, it, It's a progressive, gradual process. So we start with um, commissioning that is actually you know, not even moving the car. Um, but you know, opening and closing the doors a hundred times to make sure the doors are working right, those kinds of things. Then they do some initial car moves. Um, then they'll get to a point where we'll start taking the car out on the alignment. The first time we do that, they'll, they'll actually do it sort of you know, five miles an hour all the way through. Just a very, very methodical, slow process building up to the point where eventually then we'll, do, we'll have uh, a simulation of the actual service. So when we have four or five cars ready to go, uh, before we carry any passengers, we'll actually run the cars as if we were carrying the passengers for 10 to 14 days. Um, and that will, that will give a, a sense of uh, you know, all the things that Metro wants to 
instruct its operators on how to handle different situations and those kinds of things. So that's a pretty gradual process that's going to play out over the next few months. The, the on street testing, is it in phases or are you going to test all the way to, to John Street from the, the outset? Uh, you know, it's probably going to be in phases. Um, we have a turn back at 14th and Washington, for example. Uh, you know, so we may, you may see that there's times when, uh, you know, we're sort of just doing the Jackson piece and then other times when we're running through the entire alignment. What, how soon, what's the soonest that both the drivers and bicyclists on Broadway will need to look, be looking out for trains on Broadway? Yeah, I don't have a date certain for that yet, you know, because it, it really depends on this commissioning process, um, which is sort of an iterative process, uh, you know, they, they test some things and then they maybe do a software tweak. Um, these cars, somewhat like you know, a lot of new automobiles today, but even more so, um, are really uh, controlled by a, a computerized train controlled monitoring system um, that they very carefully fine tune. Um, and that's an iterative process during the testing. Mark, do you want to? Yeah, so let's. Uh, Again, this car is kind of furthest along. The red car will be the second one here to be completed, and then the yellow car. And so you can sort of see um, some of the differences in what, what phase they're in. Um, the, the hot pink car is starting to have some of the roof panels in, and then that allows for, you're even seeing in here, some of the, the stanchions that you saw in the completed car. Um, you know, there's these milestones where you get to move on to the next stage of assembly. Um, you can't put seats and stanchions in a car until you have a roof, a, a, a ceiling panel in the car. Uh, so that's why you see these different phases here. Um, it's kind of interesting to see sort of the, the guts and the behind the scenes elements of some of these cars um, by seeing the different phases of assembly. So we'll head on up to the mezzanine. All right, we're now on the mezzanine level of the operations and maintenance facility for the new First Hill Street car. Um, again, this facility will be used throughout the, the life of the system to keep the cars in good working order, um, do the regular inspections. Um, but it also is a facility that we were able to use to do the final assembly of some of these cars. And so what you can see, uh, here on the left is we've got some of the technicians that are doing the rooftop wiring, connecting wires and junction boxes. Um, the larger cables are high voltage wires and then there's low voltage. Um, and I'm going to point out some of the equipment that then will eventually be mounted on the roof and connected to all these wires and sort of explain the different roles of these key pieces of equipment. So these right here are what we call a pantograph. Um, and, you know, it's a spring mounted device that um, raises up, and then these carbon collectors touch the uh, contact wire that's uh, suspended over the street and provides the power for the streetcar. That's a 750 volt DC power. That brings that power into the car, and then it goes into uh, these boxes behind you. Let's we'll turn around there, and that's called the traction inverter. So that uh, takes that power, and then it, it sends it out to the different parts of the car at the, at the right voltages and amperages. Um, so this is a very important part of, of how this car works. So it's, it's sending the power down to the, the actual motor, uh, but it's sending the power into uh, the low voltage aspects as well. Um, and then what's new and different on, on these cars is this is what we call the onboard energy storage system, which is a fancy name for a rechargeable battery system. And what we're able to do with, with this, these are two boxes that sit on one on top of the other, um, full of lithium-ion lithium batteries. So the same kind of battery that um, you, know, you have in your cell phone and is rechargeable. Um, well, we've got about uh, 3,000 pounds worth of those here uh, on top of the car. And these recharge both while the car is operating on the wire connected to the pantograph, 
They also recharge from regenerative braking. Um, the way the brakes work on a streetcar or a light rail vehicle is uh, the traction motor, similar to a Toyota Prius or that kind of vehicle. The traction motor, when you press the brake, is actually spinning in reverse and that generates energy that comes back and can go back into the battery and charge it. So half of this alignment, mostly the down the part of the alignment, will actually be operating on battery power, and the other half will be operating on power from the red wires. What does that uh, in turn save money and time and things like that? Yeah. Um, so it saves some money in terms of just you know the, the power that we're using to, to run the streetcars. Um, but what's really useful about it for, for us here in Seattle and other cities do this for other or are interested in doing this for other reasons is if we don't need a wire in certain areas, that um, that can solve a variety of problems. We have a great trolley bus network here in Seattle, and a lot of that trolley bus network crosses parts of the first hill line or is parallel to it. Um, there are ways to have those two wire systems cross, and we do that a lot, but uh, it's actually pretty expensive to do that, and it saves us a lot of money uh, not to have to do that. And then in the future, we're planning to connect this new First Hill line to the South Lake Union line, operating on First Avenue. And so the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to turn that corner from Jackson on to, to uh, First Avenue and Pioneer Square, where those beautiful trees are. And that whole stretch there, we're going to have no wires overhead, we're just going to operate on battery drive through that section. So it's a really useful thing to have not only for this line but as we expand and there's a lot of other cities around the country that are interested in doing the same thing be it for uh, going over a bridge structure where they don't want to use wires or going through a, a historic part of town where they don't want to use wires. So different cities have different reasons for it. It was actually pioneered um, in Nice to go through some some uh, plaza areas there. So it has been operating for about 10 years, uh, sorry, uh, since 2007. So about eight years in, in Nice, uh, the same battery manufacturer that uh, is supplying the battery. So if a trolley, if a, if a trolley bus breaks, breaks up or bends the, the overhead wiring system to some place like uh, uh, Broadway and, and Jefferson, can these, can the streetcars run uh, off-wire temporarily to get yeah. around problems up top? Sure. Right. That's the other thing. It does provide that flexibility that, you know, if something that were a very unusual event were to occur, that normally we would be stopped until it was resolved. We could also use the battery for a, a short stretch in, in a situation like that where we don't routinely use the battery, but we, we have that available. Can these run during a power outage? Are they that well, are they that you know, robust? That that would probably be a bit beyond the you know the <laughs> capacity of the battery. Really, is is not intended to run the entire loop or to be running uphill. Um, but the situation you were describing, where you know if there was some issue at a particular intersection. Uh, and we needed to bring the pantograph down and use the battery to have that. And you said there's no need for wires right in Pioneer Square, right? Uh, but there, the city council passed something that proving eye bolts and 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 uh, right. cables. What's and that that's for? Because that's part of that's the beginning of that uphill run. So the batteries can't, you know, the batteries have to have some time to recharge. So what we did on the first hill line is we have what we call the inbound route from Capitol Hill down to Pioneer Square mm -hmm. is wireless. Okay. And the outbound route from Pioneer Square up to Capitol Hill is on the wire. But when we extend the line, it, the way it works out with the grades um, and, and the layout is in that Pioneer Square segment, we'll be able to go wireless in both directions because we will have um, a flat section to go through Pioneer Square northbound and then when we come back southbound, we will have been coming off a, a downhill grade. You, the, the, the power rolling down First Avenue will allow you to remove the outbound wire. Right. The when, outbound we get wires. Past, uh, when we get past uh, Pioneer Square, we will go back onto the wire as we climb that. You know, there's a little bit of a grade on, on First Avenue. We don't think of that as a hilly street, but, you know, if you think about you're standing in Pioneer Square and you look up, Toward the market, it actually goes uphill. Right. So we'll use the wire again when we go uphill on first time. But you'll be able to get rid of that that 
short section of wire in Pioneer Square once the First Avenue um, power is, is contributing? First no, Avenue. I think we will still, on Jackson Street, we yeah. will still have wire in one direction. In one direction. Pioneer Square, but not on First Avenue where that uh, okay. tree planted median is. Oh, yeah. Can I just add one technical thing maybe? When we were testing the blue car in, in Czech Republic, we were able to run the car on the battery up to 10 miles without the wire. So that's the that's the possible distance the tram can run. 10 the, kilometers. I think it was miles. 10 miles? 16, the 16 kilometers. Oh, okay. 16 kilometers. So, so that, that's, the, that's well, that's, that's that, that gets the theoretical that gives limit. Yeah. But yeah. That was all yeah. Yeah. up to yeah. when testing. So in the in the real in the real uh, service we can count maybe seven eight miles with people on board and fully operational. So are, are you going to uh, extend a, a warranty to SDOT where you can do that in a power outage? Uh, uh, just say again. Yeah. So again, that, that it, really this it, is yeah, it's insane. You don't want to go two miles, but you're saying that, that you think it can go. Well, seven. but you, you can go. It, it, is, it is grades as well. Yeah. So what it really about is about is not distance. It's yeah. about how much power you need to use. So you use a lot more power to go up a steep hill exactly. than just yeah. to, to go in a flat area. So as we build out our system, we'll optimize based on the actual conditions in Seattle, what are the grades, and, and how much advantage can we take of this center. The city is much more hilly than, than the place when we in, do the in your flat task. Yeah. Yeah. All right, one last, one last thing. Uh, yeah, the other thing that we just wanted to note about the facility is, uh, yeah, I mentioned the sweet gold, um, but one of the really nice functional things is this seven and a half ton capacity bridge crane um, built by Washington Crane. And with this crane, you can get to any spot in this building on the mezzanine or, or down below on the shop floor and pick up every, anything you have that weighs up to seven and a half tons, which is everything that we put on these streetcars. I mean, you don't, you don't lift up a whole streetcar with the crane, but you know, the trucks, uh, any of these pieces of equipment. So it's just a really uh, highly functional facility that you, you can do a lot with. And it allows you to do things like, if you want to work on that traction inverter when it's time to do the maintenance on that, you don't have to be out on the car in a congested setting. You can pick it up, put it on the mezzanine here, get all your tools around you, um, have a comfortable working position, all those kinds of things. Uh, so it's just a really great facility to to keep the system going for the long term and a lot of space for spare parts.